So what would you like to share or ask, Gordon? Um, I, I, I'm interested in what, going back to the, what you said at, at the start that you were in tears at the, the news of, about the war that's going on. And, uh, and then we pray, we pray for peace in the world. But why, why do we, why do we do, why do we get, why do we weep and we pray for peace? When we know that, that the suffering is caused by the orientation towards the world and that, and that that suffering is the motivation which makes us seek the, the path backwards to face backwards. What, what is it we're actually praying for? I mean, I, I know Jesus wept at least once that I can remember, possibly more times, despite knowing the origin and the cause and the the nature of suffering. And we could, you know, of, of the 8 billion people in the world, it's fairly safe to say that there's, there's a vast amount of suffering going on at any given time. And we can find people suffering. We'd have to go very far to find people suffering. How do we a not not get overwhelmed and b what what are we praying for when we're praying mm. for peace? Is that does that? Yeah, you make like, lots of good points. Seem like a, a a paradox. Another one of these pesky paradox. It it is a it is a paradox when we intellectualize it or when we think about it and put it in those terms. And I'm not saying we shouldn't think about it and we shouldn't put it in those terms. I'm not saying that at all, but it does seem like a paradox. But if we don't think about it too much, it's just the way it is. You know, if our hearts are open, we will naturally um, want to alleviate other people's suffering and will naturally weep or feel for others when they suffer. That's just a part of what it is to be a, a healthy, emotional, compassionate human being. So on the human level, that's just what happens. That's just the way it is. And, and you're right, there's, you know, at the moment, there's this war going on in Europe, right? Now, I was brought up in the UK and my parents are from India. And one of the things that was very apparent to them and to myself when I got older was how Eurocentric, how in the UK, how UK centric our media and our news is. So when I was growing up, there was all this stuff going on in other parts of the world, you know, maybe in India or in the re neighboring regions that my family were very concerned about. We were never in the news, you know. People, people didn't even know about it in the UK. You know, all this stuff going on all over the world. Of course, this is very big news. What's happening recently in Ukraine, and it's happening in Europe. So we we see it more. But you're right, Gordon. There's suffering. You don't have to look very far to find suffering, and. There's suffering happening all over the place. Now, as a human being, if we're talking about the body-mind, we, in we take in information through our senses. What we look at, what we hear, etc. And what we take in through our senses is going to be limited. So if you're watching media of some kind, where maybe it's the news, and it's blasting you with images of suffering, then your, your body-mind is going to respond to that. 
And if you are in oblivion or oblivious, sorry, if you are oblivious to that media, if you're not watching that, then you're not, you won't be aware of that suffering. So you'll be, you won't feel that suffering. You won't feel that. So very simply, what our senses take in on the body mind level will determine and affect our emotions and our attitudes, isn't it? And as a human being, we will respond according to our environment, according to our society, according, according to the information that is taken in through the senses, according to what is fed to us, and according to what we decide to attend to. I just wanted to share my tears with you so you know that there's that aspect of me. You know, because I talk about all this being illusion, this being unreal, this being a projection of thought, which is true. Tom is also a part of that illusion, and Tom functions in that illusion, and that's it. So Tom cries when he, sometimes he cries, when he, he's moved to tears sometimes, when he sees these things happening in the news. And if he didn't see those things happening in the news, even if there's great suffering happening in other places, if Tom, as a limited body mind entity, is not aware of it, isn't that what it's like for all of us? And as a limited body mind entity, Tom will, Tom's system, his physical system, his emotional system, will become overwhelmed at a certain point. You know? If you take Tom's body and you put it in a room and you play thrash metal music to it, you know, for hours and hours on end, eventually it's going to have an effect on Tom's body. That's just the way it goes. So it's overwhelming. It will overwhelm the senses. So it's like anything else. It's just the natural functioning of Maya, of the body mind, which is Maya, within the world, which is Maya. That's, and that's the way it appears. And as a part of that, we naturally want, most of us, I'm assuming, naturally want to alleviate suffering. Many of us would have, would have experienced ups and downs in our life correct all of us here all of us here all of us all human beings experience ups and downs in their lives right and some of the most important things we've ever learned and some of the things that define us come from not just the ups but from the downs right and some of the best things in your life in your lives will have happened because of this hurt and suffering Some of the best things, some of the most character-defining, character-building things in your life, life-changing things may have occurred to you through something negative, through great suffering. Does that mean you would wish that suffering on somebody else? We don't. We don't want other people to suffer. Even though this suffering is a part of, let's say, a greater plan that brings us towards liberation. That suffering, as you say, Gordon, the suffering is what encourages us to seek. And, and, and the suffering is what eventually takes us to what to seek liberation. So it's good. Doesn't mean we wish it on somebody else. Other people will suffer according to their what they need to suffer from a spiritual point of view doesn't mean we want them to suffer as a human being so there is a 
paradox there. But maybe you can make some sense out of what I've said. So what do we want for people when we see somebody, let's say we see somebody carrying in a shelter from a, from a bomb? What do you, what, you answer the question, what do you want for them? Well, we can't, we can't. It's not for me to tell you what you want. What do you want? That's not for me to tell you. I don't know what you want. What do you want to do when you see, if you see, if, if you see a child, they fall over, they graze their knee on the ground. What do you want? Do you want to watch them graze their knee and just watch them and stand them and think, well, you know, maybe some good will come out of this. I'm just going to leave them there. Or will you say, would you attend to them? What would you do? A child, say, say you're walking through a playground, Gordon. I know, I know you do that occasionally because I bumped into you <laughs> at our local kids' playground. I had an excuse to be there, by the way. Gordon, no, Gordon saw me. Gordon saw me, so he came up to meet me. Um, I was with my kids, and then Gordon popped in because he saw me there. I'm assuming. And then... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I actually wanted to go on the slide, but <laughs> <laughs> so may, imagine you're walking through a kid's playground and suddenly a young child runs straight into you. They clearly didn't see you there. They run into your legs, they knock themselves onto the floor. Do you A attend to them, check they're okay, or do you B just ignore them because who knows, maybe um, they're going to have, have great benefit from their suffering. Because it could be, it could be that you leave them and they sort of, they're sort of lying on the ground for 10 minutes. And in that 10 minutes of lying in the ground in pain, they have some kind of amazing spiritual epiphany that changes their life for the better. That could be what happens, right? So is that what you do? Or do you say, oh gosh, I just knocked you over. Are you okay? And you make sure they're okay. Maybe you see if their mum or dad is around or something. You know, what do you, which one do you do? Well, I mean, that, that's, the, that's the situation that's in front of you that you can action. I mean, we're, 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 but just, just answer that one first, because the, the reason I'm putting that one to you is because it's a simple case that hopefully has got a fairly straightforward answer. Well, I'd, I'd like to think I would do what I can. You would. Alleviate the suffering. You would. But I could then argue with you, Gordon, if I wanted to play devil's advocate and say to you, well, look, it may be if you hadn't intervened, a greater good would have come about, you see, through that suffering. Do you see my point? And that's true. And we don't, we don't know if that's going to be the case or not. If you are 100% sure that would have been the case, then maybe you'd leave them. But you can't be 100% sure that would be the case. You know that's just the possibility. So you don't know what the outcome is going to be. So given that you don't know what the outcome is going to be, what do you do? Well, you take the best course of action you can, which is you attend to them. So you do what you do. You do what you can do. It would be unethical not to. It would. And you wouldn't feel right to you. you. You wouldn't feel right to any of us if we just stood there <laughs> <laughs> watching a helpless child suffering on the ground after they ran into you. You wouldn't feel right to any of us. Yeah, you would be a sociopath. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you act spontaneously, naturally, with compassion, with thought, with care, with consideration, to the best of your ability at the time. You know? That's all we do, and that's all we can do. You actually have no choice but to do that. When, when something like this happens, you have no choice but to act um, in the way, in the best possible way you're able to, given your current ability and level of skills and awareness and et cetera, your mental state at the time, et cetera, you know? Maybe, and let's move this away from you, Gordon. Maybe if this was a, 
a hypothetical situation with a person, if that person was drunk and a child ran into them, maybe they wouldn't be able to act so skillfully because they'll be inebriated, they'll be intoxicated, you see. But they, they would still maybe try and do their best, but they'll be handicapped because of because they're intoxicated, you see. And or maybe you've got somebody who's highly anxious, got a massive social phobia. That would in, that would similarly impair their ability to respond, but they'll still do their best. Maybe they wouldn't be able to do anything though, because their maybe their mental health problems would be too severe. And so on and so on. So we would do our best given the constraints of the situation we're in and our own current um, disposition at the time, you know, mental health, physical health, ability to respond. We have no choice. So when, when I'm watching the news and I'm seeing these reports and I'm hearing these things coming through, I can't help but feel waves of compassion and sadness and empathy and all the such that I'm sure many, many of you have felt, you know. Does that make sense, Gordon? Kind of. I mean, I think our, our perceptions are so complicated now. You know, we could pick, we can pick things up from anywhere in the world that we can't action directly or in any kind of short term. Maybe we could send a donation Maybe we could go out there and help. Maybe join the Red Cross. Well, you make a choice. You make a choice based on your situation, your knowledge, your personality. You make a choice what to do. Some people will catch the first plane to Ukraine and try and help in whatever way they can. Other people will do nothing. You know. Other people do something in between. Maybe give some money. You know. So you make a choice based upon your conditioning, your knowledge, your experience, your personality, your genetics, et cetera, et cetera. That's just what happens. That's just the way the body mind functions. Maybe you make a judgment, there's nothing you can do. And so, you don't make any obvious action. Do you know what I mean? Maybe, so you, you, you make an assessment, don't you? You assess. The, 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 brain or, the brain or the mind makes an assessment. You can't help but make an assessment of some kind. Oh, there's nothing I can do. Oh, there's something I can do. There's a, oh, there's a lot I can do. Based on your beliefs, your conditioning, personality, your culture. your state of mind, whether or not you're intoxicated, if you have mental health issues or not, if you have financial issues, the whole myriad of factors that have made up your present moment. That's just what happens. Is, does that make sense, Gordon? Or are you still um, not sure about what I'm saying or about that this issue you have? So, when we say shanti, 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 peace to me, peace to you, peace to the suffering world, I'm just I'm not sure what, what it is I want for the suffering world. Well, what do you want? It's not for me to tell you what you want. Happy. What do you want? May all the beings of all the worlds be happy. Do you want that? I think so. Yeah. So that's why that's probably why you say it then, Gordon. Yeah, because you want people to be happy, right? 
as long as you take yourself to be body mind, you will take others to be body mind, and you want yourself and others to be happy. Isn't it? It's a function of the body mind. What do I say at the beginning of every call? What do I say at the end of every call? Every, every satsang. What do I say at the beginning of every satsang? What do I say at the end of every satsang? At the beginning, I say, I hope you're all well. Don't I? I don't do it on purpose, by the way. It's just what I naturally say at the beginning of every blimming satsang. It's just a spontaneous. Every time, I know it's the same. I know I say the same phrase every time, but each time it's new and spontaneous for me. And at the end of every satsang, I say something like, My love to you all. It's again, it's the genuine, spontaneous expression in that moment. I mean it. It's the same for you. Don't you want, when you come to this satsang, don't you think to yourself, I hope everybody's well? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. You don't have to. Don't you want everybody here to be happy and well? But then what did I say? I then said today, I said, the primary purpose we're here today is not to make other people happy. We're not here today primarily to make other people happy. We're not here today primarily to save the world in the, in the conventional sense. We're not here primarily today to solve political problems, to solve social problems, not even to solve health problems. That's not, our, that's not the reason we're gathering here. That's not the primary reason we've come here together today. We want those things too, right? We're not saying we don't want those things at all. We're not saying, I'm not saying I don't want anyone here to be healthy. I'm not saying I don't want society to be healthier and happier. And I'm not saying I don't want peace in the world. Not at all. We do want those things. But that's not the purpose of this meeting. That's not the primary purpose. The primary purpose, although we, want, we do want all those things, the primary purpose is we want to realize the self. It's the greatest good, the greatest deed. That's the primary purpose. Doesn't mean we don't also want to do other things. I wish you all happiness and health. Of course I do. On that level, you see. It's just like my love for Bhagwan. Why do I love Ramana? It's the same. It's just a spontaneous, natural expression of my love. I love Bhagwan Ramana. He is my guru, my teacher. I'm devoted to him. Why? It's just the way it is. <laughs> The primary purpose of this meeting is not to be devoted to an external form called Ramana. No. The primary purpose of the meeting is to discover yourself. But we also have these other things as well. Does that help at all, Gordon? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't sound very convincing to me. You don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that um, it has cleared your doubt. But why don't you, if, it, if it has cleared your doubt, that's great. If it hasn't, have a think and then come back. Let, let, these, let, let my words marinate in them a bit, have a think about them, contemplate what I'm saying. Well, 
Thank so, you. when Ramana says the greatest seva one, one can do is to discover the self. Uh, I can't remember the exact wording. So, ahimsa is implied in, in that, is contained within that, no longer. Why worry about ahimsa? So ahimsa means, um, just for everybody, in case you don't know these, this word, ahimsa means non-violence or do no harm. It's this essential ten. This essential ethical tenet in most traditions, including most Eastern Eastern traditions, Vedic traditions, and Buddhist traditions, Jainist traditions. Why worry about why why when we say we discover the self? I said earlier it's given that we should be good to each other, but why worry about ahimsa in terms of to self do good be good to the best of your ability you're not always going to be able to do it perfectly but do it to the best you be good be caring be considerate when you when you speak try and speak in a gentle way to people we never know what immense suffering other people are going through Never know what immense suffering other people are going, to, are going through. Always try and be considerate and speak gently to others. Always. You're going to mess up. But we should try and do this, right? It's basic consideration and compassion towards others. You know, we want naturally, if our hearts are open, we will want other people to be happy and we will act accordingly as much as we're able to depending on our resources, depending on our mental resources, our physical resources, our financial resources, our resource of time, etc. But then we need to discover what we are. Because all the, everything else is actually illusion. It's not reality at all. It's actually fiction. The most important thing really is to get out of the dream, get out of the fiction, discover the reality. We're in a fictional world. We're in an illusory world, a dualistic world that's created by the ego, by ignorance. And as long as we attend to it, we'll stay lost in this maze of Maya. So we have to come out. In the self, there is no room for himsa or ahimsa. Himsa means harm. Ahimsa means no harm. There's no room for violence or non-violence in the self. Both of these are, pertain only to Maya. So why worry about violence or non-violence with regard to the self? There is no violence. There is no non-violence in the self. It's beyond all these things. So on a relative level, be good do good, et cetera, et cetera. And you will do that already according to your own ability. But we eventually we have to leave all that behind, all of Maya behind, including good, bad, right, wrong, all this stuff, and go in, turn inwards. In the self, there is no time. There's no space. Right? It cannot be imagined. The self is unimaginable. In the scriptures, they say it's unfathomable. It cannot be understood. When there's no time, when there's no space, where is the room for ethics? There is no good or bad or anything in the self. It's just, we can say it's pure goodness. It's just absolute goodness beyond relative good and bad beyond relative right and wrong it's just pure righteousness it's just it's just my an expression just a way of trying to express that this is something absolute joy absolute love pure divinity pure heaven but not in a relative sense 
We don't have to philosophically reconcile ahimsa with self-realization, you see. Ahimsa is for the world. Nonviolence, ethics, morality is for maya. What we are is not really a body and mind. There is actually no one. There is no people. There are no people. My grammar's going. There is no people. <laughs> There are no body minds. There are no separate people. There are no others. This is illusion. This is fiction. When we don't discover it, then we play that out. When we discover it, it's different. Tom still appears to see the body. Tom, the the body mind. Tom will still appear to operate in that duality. But that is not actually what I am. And the same goes for you. That is not actually what you are. So this talk of ethics, morality, compassion, how to act, this is all on the level of the body-mind, right? There are only two concepts in Vedanta. That's all on the concept of maya, illusion. The self, we don't have any of these issues, any of these problems. We don't even have a we, as in that we don't even have us. There's no geality. There's no individuality. It's just pure perfection. Remember in Who Am I, the text Who Am I, written by Bhagwan Ramana. Bhagwan writes, we, the good thoughts, the auspicious thoughts, the holy thoughts, they must also go. Not just the bad thoughts must go, but the good thoughts. And we can infer that he also means not just the bad deeds should go. You shouldn't just get rid of bad deeds, but the, we go beyond the good deeds as well. See, beyond all karma, karma means action or deeds. There's no karma, meaning no action, no deeds in the self. Karma requires time and space. It only is in maya. Karma is maya. Maya is karma. There are only two concepts in Vedanta. So if you hear karma, what, what, what concept is that going to be? Is that going to be maya or the self? It's going to be maya. Any concept you come across, you can say, well, where does this fit? Does this fit in the concept of reality or the concept of illusion? If it involves multiplicity, if it involves time, if it involves space, then it's in Maya. If it cannot be described, if it cannot be understood, if it's pure utter positivity or divinity that cannot be explained, that is the reality, that is the self, that is what you are. If it pertains to objects, it is Maya. If it does not pertain to objects, that means the subject, it must be the self. So you can use this two concept teaching to help you figure out what, other, you know, there are all these other concepts in spirituality. You can figure out where they fit. Interestingly, I've said this two concepts thing on and off for a while. A few a couple of months ago, I read I read um, one of Shankara's commentaries where he also said there are only two concepts in Vedanta. I was very happy to read that. So Shankara, I can't I can't remember where it was one of the comment commentaries of one of the Upanishads, or it might be the Brahma Sutra commentary. Shankara says there are only two concepts in Vedanta. I thought, oh. Glad I'm not the only one who thought that.
because I hadn't seen that written anywhere. There's two concepts there. Or I hadn't heard it from anyone anywhere else. But these teachings come from the heart. So it's not surprising we find the same teachings in these different places, because all these places are coming from the heart. Okay, good. Thank you. And thank you again for the beautiful music, gorgeous music. <laughs>